All right, hello. Continuing back with the 32-bit operating system development here. I got a couple of small bug fixes or changes to make, and then I want to make things a little bit more flexible for loading and running files instead of the plain flat binary that I've been doing as far as the calculator and editor at least. I want to kind of change to run and load either ELF, executable and linkable format, executables, or PE for portable executables. So I want to get towards that. I'll probably deal with ELF to start off with because I'm on, I'm on Linux here. But before I do that, I want to fix a bug or two that's preventing me from using the OS in certain places. Um, mainly if I run the tests and then try to reboot, it doesn't work. So I know I'm not writing to the right place on the file system. So I can show that here. If I just run it and look, you know, I have these default files, we can run tests, and that makes more files. So if I use directory, it makes uh, everything after kernel. So I'm testing open and close, seeking, reading and writing. I make new files for those things, which is fine. I'm just typing hello world to these right now. So I have a, a type command where I can type out what data I write to these newly written files. But afterwards, if I want to reboot for whatever reason and try things out later, shut it down and reload the OS, it doesn't work. We get a black screen or maybe it'll triple fault or just not work at all. So I know something's wrong with reading and writing files there. And I want to figure out what that is. So if I go to the bottom, I forgot some of these have blank, <laughs> blank lines at the bottom. If I go to the file at the bottom where I'm running the tests that I'm doing in that run test command, they're pretty simple, they're pretty basic. I'm making a new file, getting a descriptor for that, and basically reading or writing data through that, through my own system calls, right? That's fine. So there's nothing really that, that appears or jumps out at me during these test cases, so to speak, but I know it breaks something because we can't reboot after we run some of these tests. So I know all that they're doing really is calling open, printf, open, close, and read or write, at least for the read and write test. <laughs> so the issue with that is I think it's putting the files at the wrong position on the disk. So that was in, let's say, system calls. I don't know if it's the syscall open. Yeah, we'll look at that. So it calls create file ultimately if it doesn't exist, and that puts the file at a certain location on the disk, which I think is incorrect, or it's overriding the kernel or some other things, which prevents a clean reboot. So if I look at the create file, which is in the file system implementation file here, create file, it, it makes some new inodes within the parent inode, sets up the paths and all that, checks if the blocks are going to be greater, and I got some to-dos that I'm not doing, of course. <laughs> And it read writes to certain sectors on the disk to make up those files and all. So we're using bits though to get the new files. And that comes from where? It comes from up here somewhere. Yeah, so we're getting a new inode and we're making the new inode. We have the position within the inode bitmap and the inode blocks on the disk. And it does that for the data bits as well. So uh, after tracking it down a bit, I believe the issue is just within the first data bit that it's getting. So I just have a block of bits, you know, ones or zeros, specifying, hey, this four kilobyte chunk or block on the disk is free. If it's zero, it's used if it's one. So I'm just getting the first zero bit within that bitmap saying, hey, there's a four kilobyte chunk of space here we can use for a new file in this case. And I think that's not going to the right location for any new files on boot, and that's why the reboots break. It's like overriding part of the kernel, or it's saying on the disk we're writing to this location and it's actually not free. So, I, yeah, we're overriding part of the kernel or other needed stuff. And that happens sort of in the boot sector, I think, is where I'm getting that, where I'm actually loading the stuff because I'm loading the super block with the overall file system info, I'm loading the bootloader from that, and I guess the third stage loads, actually. It's been a while since I've looked at this. <laughs> other than a cursory glance to figure out why it wouldn't reboot the other day, so... I know I get the kernel somewhere in here. I remove the mapping, and I load it from disk with load file, okay, so I get an address and load it to there. After searching through this stuff, okay. And then load file takes in the actual disk blocks. Because that's at the top here. So load file uses where the actual disk is, according to the blocks set in the extents from the inode. All right, anyway, that corresponds to the bits in the bitmap saying where the data blocks are. 
And initially those are set up from the make disk program from you know where it writes the inodes, where it writes the file data to start off with, and in the super block where it gets that first free data bit, for example. That's where it takes the location to write a new file to. And then it'll, it'll update this bit and update the data bitmap. So I know ultimately this is wrong, or in combination with other things, it's wrong. Uh, but I believe these are wrong, so I know I should change these. And initially when we make the file system, we have a certain number of blocks, right? File block, sans boot block. So it, really this is plus two for the boot sector in the second stage, taking up a minimum of one block of disk space. But I say in our file system, we're not dealing with those right now. We're only dealing with these and these numbers and blocks add up to 45. Okay. So other than that, we know at minimum... Uh, at minimum, the first free bit should probably probably be after all of the file data that's taken up on disk, so it should be at least bit 45 if we're going zero-based indexing. If it takes up 45 blocks, and that's 45 bits in the bitmap, that's bits 0 to 44 at minimum, right? So this should be 45 to start off with, if not higher. I know I'm adding one here for the root directory entry. In the future, the root directory could be a lot larger in other file system things. Right now, we can make that a little bit more dynamic and not use a magic number one here, for example. If we do something like, I don't know, we'll have root directory blocks taken up by the root directory, which right now is just the number of files um, that we're gonna have in the root directory. Because by default, I'm just putting all these in the root directory. <laughs> I'm not making any other folders. I will in the future. Of course, it'll be without these two. So it'll be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine files, and then we'll have the dot and dot dot directory entries for the root directory, which will be 11. And overall, this is 11 entries anyway. So I can probably say it's just gonna be the number of files here, which is that array. But normally it would be like, you know, minus, minus two for the, the boot sector in the second stage that I'm not using, and then plus two for the dot and dot dot root directory entries. You know, implicitly, well, I can write that out, I guess. It just ends up being the same number right here. And then we'll have, I think I have, in the file system, the directory entries per block, yeah, which is just the block size, which should be 4K. Yeah, 4096, divided by the size of whatever the directory entry is, which is going to be 60. 64, rather. So that's what times... So times 8 would be 512 times 8. So there should be 64 entries we could fit within a block. But we'll just do this. So we'll have the number of files divided by directory entries. And we'll also do... Uh, I guess I don't have to double wrap these in parentheses, but that's fine. Also do the number modulo directory entries per block, not just directory entries. per block, and if that's greater than one, we'll add one, else we'll add zero, just for a partial amount there. So that would give the number of blocks taken up by the root directory in the file system itself, in the data blocks. And we can use that instead of just a one here, which it will be a one, unless we have more than 64 files. We can just put that here. So we have something that makes a little bit more sense. I'll get rid of that comment. So ultimately we'll have the file blocks plus that, and I'll probably just do, yeah, we'll just do file blocks just in case, and that should make it work. So before it was the number of blocks taken up by files, which is 45, I subtract two, it's actually 47, uh, but minus two would be 45, and then it'd be a root directory block, which would be one, so it'd be at 46, but obviously that's not working because it breaks reboots. But from testing with this, it seemed to work. This will be zero-based index of first available disk block in data bitmap. But these will ultimately be the same, so I could just set it to number data blocks as well. But anyway, so we'll see blocks taken by initial root directory on disk. So I'm doing files, files minus two for no boot sector in second stage, plus two for dot and dot dot directory entries. 
So if you're wondering why if you're wondering why I'm doing that, it's because it's it's that. Now I do want to fix that eventually and not do not like paper over the issue by doing this because it looks kind of jank, but that's all right. But instead of doing file blocks minus two plus one, which would be file blocks minus one, which wasn't working, I figure this makes more sense and is probably a little better and more dynamic. We just have the number of data, the number of blocks taken up by files plus the number of blocks taken up by the root directory. Right after that point on the disk, we can start writing new data that's free and available disk space. So that's that's the point at which I can write new files. And I think that should fix the issue with reboots because the initial disk block that we write to uh, will be valid and it won't be taking up anything like the kernel, which is at the end of the file system, right? So I'm just testing here and checking that we can still read and write files. But if I do a reboot now, it loads up, so we're not overriding the end of the kernel or whatever was there, which I guess I was doing before. Um, and that all works, and that's all well and good, so that's nice. <laughs> My only other issue with that is, well, it's not an issue because it works, but I don't understand why I sort of need an implicit plus two blocks here, because I'm not including the boot sector or the second stage, but I need to include all of the file blocks, including those taken up by... Yeah, this is where those are initially gotten, that number for file blocks. So the number of blocks initially taken up by the files, including the boot sector and second stage, I have to go after that in the file system. I'm not sure why. Because when I write the when I write the inodes and I write the, the data blocks as part of this program, um, I'm offsetting by two inside of the files array. So like I'm not <laughs> I'm not writing the actual data after the boot block to the file system or to the disk, at least that I can see anywhere. So I'm not sure why I need to include those blocks as an offset when I set up these initial bits and data blocks and all. I just, I just don't know. <laughs> so, and I can prove that if I do minus one here, then that'll break rebooting. I just want to show that. So if I do run tests and then I do reboot, uh, well, actually that does work. So never mind. <laughs> I feel like that didn't work before. Maybe it does. I don't think it does. Yeah, okay. So I get failures if I run the tests again. And then it fails to reboot. But if I don't do minus one, I know it has to be at least this many blocks. So if I don't do minus one and I run tests... Uh, if I type it correctly and put the actual S there and I do that, we can run it again, and it's fine. Then it reboots and it all works, right? And the tests complete every single time, we can reboot, and it's it's still all right. So I don't know why I need the extra sort of two blocks there, even though I'm not writing those initial files. Uh, and that's the same as it was on last boot. Yeah, I don't know why I have to do that, but anyway, that fixes, you know, one reboot issue, which is glaring, so that's that's not great. <laughs> um, the next immediate thing I wanted to do was get rid of malloc tests, because that doesn't work right now either. Just exit out of everything so it's not in the background. So the malloc test doesn't work probably because I'm calling malloc and free and it doesn't have the same sort of malloc block linked list that I've set up in the kernel and elsewhere. It's like separate in the separate file. So that's probably why it doesn't work. I don't really know. Or I'm using some weird void pointer nonsense that it doesn't like. So it gives page faults, but I don't really need that to be a separate thing anyway. I can just include that as a test we run in the kernel and I can clean that stuff up a little bit. So I'm going to do that. Because we don't really need this. All this is doing is just printing data to the screen to prove we can run malloc and free. <laughs> so that's all right. So I go to the where I'm running my test commands. I'm just doing a struct with the, the name of a test to run and a function pointer that returns a bool and takes in no arguments. And that's just a function I run. And if the bool is true, I print OK, the test passed. If it's false, I print in red, hey, we failed. So I can add, you know, more tests here arbitrarily. We'll just say malloc free, or I did open and close. So we'll do malloc and free tests. And I'll say I have a test malloc function. Maybe I'll just line these up slightly. 
Well, maybe not. Actually, it doesn't really matter. But anyway, <laughs> we'll have a test malloc at the bottom. That'll do. Which is just a Boolean function that takes in nothing. So we'll test malloc and free function calls. I think I do have them set up as system calls, but that's fine. That's fine. We'll uh, I'll just return true at the bottom by default. And as part of the function, I'm just going to do all this stuff. So I don't have to set up anything differently. Don't need a separate section for everything. I'm just going to move the malloc test into the kernel directly as part of the test suite that we run. Um, this was back when I was doing explicit sort of cursor control. So I don't need to do that here with printf and co because my terminal driver, if you will, emulator, not really, <laughs> has an implicit x and y. So we don't really need to mess with that. And I clear the screen anyway, so that's fine. If I'm running it as part of the test and I'm printing out the info, then I don't need to do that. So we could print out the stuff we're doing. That's probably all right, but we don't need to call print string anymore. We can call print F and I don't need explicit X and Y's. These shouldn't need to be static either. We can just have some buffers here. So we can refactor and simplify this quite a bit. And I know we'll be running malloc tests because the, the test runner will print out the name that we did and name that test malloc as well. Yeah, so it'll print out malloc and free test, so I don't have to print that. No. Okay. So we'll save malloc 100, and then we'll have printf stuff, so this will be a lot better. malloc percent, uh, percent %d is fine. Bytes to address, percent, I'm printing hex here. Percent hex, and We'll just do that, and that'll be buffer. I guess that's a void pointer, so I have to say, hey, it's a uint32, and then we can get rid of these lines, and then we'll be freeing the bytes as well. Although I don't really need to do that, I guess. Uh, eh, it's fine. We'll see how it looks. And the other, the other things I did were pretty similar. I guess we can just say 100 instead of doing that. 42 bytes to another address, and that would be buff2. And it'll print freeing bytes. Except this will be buff2. And we have multiple tests. Uh... 250 bytes to address 3. This will be 6,000 bytes to address 4. And 333 bytes. Three hundred and thirty-three bytes to address 5. And then we go and free those 453. And then press any key to return. That's fine. But I don't need to get a key because this will just be part of the test suite that's going to be running. So we'll just return true there. It would be nice to have some false cases, <laughs> something that we should check against, you know, an assert statement or something. Not sure how I would want to do that. I guess if we don't have memory leaks, we'd have to detect if we do have memory leaks, though. So if we free, I mean, I can check that the same buffer is used between these two. I mean, that might be like a basic thing to check. Of course, I'd have to delay freeing it until later, so I don't know. And we can just see how this works right now. If it works, which it doesn't. Test malloc undeclared. Because I think the other ones I put at the top, right? Test read. Okay, yeah. Because C doesn't have multiple pass compilation for some reason. In the year 21, whatever it is. In the year 20XX. So we can just put that there. Okay, but well that compiles. So I'm going to remove this binary, the malloc text, malloc test bin. I'll be removing that in a minute. I just want to see that we can malloc and free stuff now. So 306430, that's fine. 42 bytes to the same address, that's fine. And then again to the same address and then plus a bit and then plus a bit. So if I remember right, my malloc sort of metadata is 12 bytes in length. So this number should be 
basically 262 bytes above this. Is that correct? I don't know. I would assume maybe it is. So if we say, I guess 16 would be the input. So we'll have 30, I guess I can, I can subtract them. 306536 and 306430, subtract and then print 262. Okay, so that's 250 plus 12 bytes for the malloc header. So that seems correct. And then we can do the same thing for the other one, 307CB2 and uh, 6536, 6536, and that's a bad character because this probably has to be in caps. Yeah, so 6,000 bytes plus 12 for the header. Yeah, so that seems all right. That seems correct. And we're using a couple more memory sort of blocks for that, but that's okay. And does reboot still work? Hey, reboot still works, so we're good to go there. Okay. So that just proves that we can run malloc and free, and I can delete that if I press the right key combination. So we shouldn't need the malloc test, test uh, you know, full-on files anymore, so I'm going to get rid of those. So.c, oh, get out of here. And if I run make clean, look in the bin file, it's not going to be there. Source file. We don't have malloc tests anymore, so that's good. So I need to remove it or else I'll get errors when we're building the disk image. I don't want that anymore. And I think that's all I should have to do. So we have 43 now, two less blocks taken up by that previous file. Just making sure it's not here in the initial file system either. We can run the test, the tests will run there. I should probably put a new line here after this, just in case, because it'll look a little bit better. But test pass five out of five now. And I can do reboot and run it again just to make sure. Okay. Make sure that still works. Make sure the other functions still work. All right. So now that I got that all working, let me just put a new line there for the first one so it looks a little bit better. Malloc and free, so we get a new line and it runs that. All right. So I am okay with that. Refactor to use printf, don't clear screen, fix, fix page faults. I think I did that. Move the logic there and removed. Need to remove the LD file as well. Thank you, self. Yep, remove that. Okay. So given those changes, I do want to implement some primitive form of L for PE loading, probably ELF because I'm on Linux and I can do that easier on here. Although with Clang, I could set targets and make either type of file for testing. So I might do that as well. But all right, so the editor and the calculator, I think I can make, change the compilation, make them position independent executables instead of just flat binaries as they currently are with everything else. That way I can get rid of the linker scripts. They won't be needed anymore, which is nice. I'm only going to be... Uh, implementing dynamic executable, so the PIE files, position independent, not a fixed address that I have to do relocation and fix-ups on, and I'm not doing sort of shared library code. So I'm keeping it very simple and just saying, hey, uh, well, this might not even be static, but I'm assuming we can probably test static Pi objects as well, but it's a dynamic executable. It can be at any position in virtual memory. So it doesn't matter if the file itself says, hey, load me it four megabyte, you know, 400,000 in hex as my entry point. Load me at 10,000 for my entry point. It doesn't matter what that says. We can load it anywhere in memory because of its position independent. So all of the labels, all of the addresses and, and data and things will be referred to as offsets, either from a global offset table or a program linkage table or something else. Or for these, it might not even have that and we might not have to worry about it. We'll see. But for my simple programs like the calculator, we shouldn't need to worry about that stuff. We can just say, hey, load it to some area in memory and jump to it and have it work. But we have to load the certain sections of the file to memory and go through that. So that's what I'll be doing uh, here. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, it's going to be broken, but I can change the make file to sort of handle that first. 
I am getting all the C files right now. I probably want to exclude some of these, such as the calculator and the editor, and not have them be part of this. I do want to change the make file more later anyway to be a little bit better and like not need to do this for assembly and uh, have actual incremental compilation instead of building everything all the time, every time. But anyway, I'll probably just add PIE to the C flags and have them be separate from the normal C files here. So we can say, I think not name and like exclude things this way. This is a bad way of doing it, but right now it's probably okay. So I want to include all the C files that aren't named calculator.c and are not named editor.c and then strip it off at the end anyway and do that stuff. So that will prevent, yeah, the calculator and the editor from being compiled here. At least as at least from the make file. Okay, but I still want to include them, so I guess I will handle them separately. So we have C files here, we'll say other C files or something, <laughs> or pi files or something else. I don't really want to do it like this, but we can try it. I could also switch to do everything as pi and then the kernel being its own thing, which would look a little bit better than this jank I'm about to do, but that's, that's all right. Let's call it like exes or something. We'll have calculator and we'll have editor. So I'm going to do, I guess, after here, because make disk will call and make it anyway. So I'm just going to copy the C files. We'll have it be exes. And we'll do the C flags and I'll also add PIE. But I think I just do dash. It might be dash F. Position independent executable. We'll make it into calculator or editor.o and we'll do the same stuff, except instead of doing this fancy linking stuff by using a specific linker script and making a binary, I'm just going to directly make it into its output if possible. And I'll put it into bin directory dot, dot bin. So this would be bin directory calculator dot bin or editor dot bin from source directory calculator or editor dot C. And I'm not going to do this. And I'm going to bypass the .o file, so I shouldn't need to do that, and we'll see if that works. Okay, so it did make them, and they are over there. We got the third stage, second stage. We got at, so actually, no, that didn't work. Because <laughs> why would it, right? Ooh, that's, that's not good. I did call it at and not dollar at. That would be why. All right, and this says it did go through and have the calculator and the editor still there. All right, and that takes up a little bit more space, actually, which is interesting. But we have the calculator and the editor there, so that's nice. Okay. And if I run file on those, we can see that they will be different as opposed to, say, the third stage.bin, which is a flat binary. It just returns data. And the main OS says it has a boot sector, because it does, technically. That's what we're using. But the calculator, for example, is a an ELF file now, a 32-bit specifically ELF file. Least significant bit relocatable for the 8386, because I'm doing dash M386 or whatever. System 5 not stripped. So if I use read ELF on that, we can see some data about it. Uh, I think it's dash H for the header, header info. So we got magic 7F ELF, which specifies an ELF file. The typer class, the class is, I guess, 1 is 32 and 2 is 64. What it looks like, because I think it comes from these up here somewhat. 2 is complement, little Indian, version 1, that's fine. Relocatable, so type REL. So we can either search and see, because that's a type in the ELF header. We can do REL or DYN is kind of what I wanted to do. If that's possible, or EXE, which I think is not super relocatable, but that's all right. Um, okay, so the C flags have no pi, so actually I don't want to use these C flags. So let's do other ones. We'll say exe C flags, that's fine. So we'll do, instead of no pi, we'll do pi. 
What you can do upper or lowercase. I don't remember what the difference is. I think there is a difference though, but I'm going to do uppercase because I like yelling out that I, I like pie. <laughs> Apple or blueberry or whatever. I guess I'll have the other things same as those though. And I'll consolidate this stuff later, maybe in the future. <laughs> right now, just, of course, you gotta do things the worst way trying to get it to work right. We'll use those other C flags to specifically say it's a pie executable. And that's still relocatable, that's fine. Okay, so it, it returns the same stuff. I just wanted to make sure that that took a took priority there. So we have a number of section and program headers and stuff for this. I'm not going to be worrying about the section headers. I should only need to worry about the program headers, which is interesting because it doesn't have any. <laughs> so maybe it just made an object and not a final bin file, which is very interesting. I kind of want to change it to where it's an executable if possible. Maybe I don't do this for that. I don't remember exactly. So I won't need that there. I could do a separate linker step as well. I'm not sure if I need to. I could do it in two steps and see what happens. As a difference, though. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. I'm just doing the dash C here. <laughs> yeah, don't do the dash C, because I was like, that doesn't look how I remember. That's not a, a full executable. That's just the object. Yeah. So don't... If you do the dash C, it just makes an object. I need to not do that so it actually makes the whole thing okay then we have some issues here because i'm on alpine linux and i gotta be difficult skipping incompatible shared and other things cannot link to lgcc so we probably do need a separate linker step and that's okay can't get around it all right so I will do a separate linker step then. I will not use a specific script though. And I'm not going to set the output format. But I will say... I mean, they can make the dot O in here, that's alright. We'll just get rid of that here again. Like I'm doing for the normal C files. Okay. So we'll take the dot o, we'll make it a dot bin, but we'll say, yeah, we're going to link it for that. So hopefully, yeah, I get rid of the other things. And it cannot find start, which is interesting. Defaults to whatever that is, which is okay. We can deal with that when we load it up later. As long as it makes the file, that'll be all right. And it did make it. Okay, now it's an executable, which I feel like it did not say before. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so it's an EXEC, so it is an executable now, not just an object. And it has program headers, which is what I was looking for. Because <laughs> that's the stuff we have to load. It'll correspond to code or data or other things for the, the program to actually run. And memory. So that looks a little bit better. Similarly for the editor, so the entry point it sets at some default thing according to, you know, your OS and your platform and all. I'm not going to worry about that. Um, we'll have an entry point address, even though we don't have a specific start address. I think that's because we don't have the right main and everything, right? Because I changed those to put them at specific sections, so I don't have to do this anymore if I'm doing an ELF file and not a flat binary. So I'm going to get rid of that. And we'll just do main. <laughs> which it should be able to pick up as the entry point for the calculator, for example. Although it says it still can't find entry symbol start, that's interesting. I'm not doing anything really special with that. I guess I'll have int main, because that's what it might be expecting. And it still defaults to it. Oh well. <laughs> we won't have to do specific uh, sections that we put main into, though if we do pies, so at least that's good. Just call it main. Oh, 
Okay, we'll see. This might be an issue later. I'm not sure, but <laughs> starting off, we'll just say, eh, I'm not going to worry about it. That might be something I can set up in the make file as well. I don't think, though. I don't think so, though. Yeah, lowercase versus uppercase pi doesn't do anything, but anyway. That's fine. So in the include folder, I don't have anything for either of these. So let's say I might put them under a different folder later anyway. Let's say we have something like elf, right? Or elf32. We'll say elf. Elf will have elf.h. Yeah, that'll be okay. And then I'll make that. I'll say types, I don't know, types, definitions, functions, etc. for loading and running elf executables. Eventually we'll do objects. Maybe I'll just say objects, I don't know. Or maybe not eventually. We'll see. <laughs> but I know we have elf headers and things. I know on Linux you can just directly include elf.h on other platforms that's not necessarily true like this one like on windows for example uh, but we do have that i don't think it'll show up in in which or in elf it's probably under like user include is it under there yeah user include elf.h so i can look in there just to see what's on my system by default right we have all this stuff so we can use this automatically or i can copy it really that might be smart <laughs> Uh, I put that in a separate terminal window. That's my mistake. There we go. Except I know mine, I'm doing my own C standard int, although I have the same files pretty much. But we can just copy all this stuff, right? That, that'll be all right. At least for ELF32. ELF64 I'm not doing, although in my UEFI stuff I will be doing 64-bit loading. But for 32-bit, it's a little bit different. Oh, they did, uh, they did Octal for that. Interesting. Interesting. We have all the OS ABIs. I don't really care too much. I just really need the header and like the program headers, section headers later possibly. Just interesting to see what they have. Relocation info. Yeah, I need the program headers. I know I need those. Um, you can look up these on your own and see what they kind of stand for. I mean, there's man. If you do man elf, well, that doesn't look good in there, does it? <laughs> man elf shows some stuff and tells you basically all you need to know about the things, but it's not too much. It gives you the different types and the versions and the definitions of all the fields. So I'd recommend reading up on that if you want, or on Wikipedia, the executable and linkable format, it's fine. It also gives tables of all the stuff. So if you're on Linux and you don't have, or if you're on like Windows or another platform that doesn't have man elf, you can look here or you can, you know, Google the man page for it. But that's all right. I'm not going to do dynamic relocation. I don't think there's other things that I need from here. Ver need. That's interesting. Verno. That's, is that not, is this French? No, it's auxiliary. 3,300 pages. I don't think I need to go through all of that. So, all right. I probably will only be dealing with program headers and the overall entry header or what elf header, I guess, is what e header is here. And dealing with that kind of stuff, so, okay. And I won't need to deal with 64. If I'm just doing 32-bit. So we'll just do that. So that seems okay, and I'm not going to be using versim here. I just want this to be sort of the bare minimum that I'm going to be using. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. So that stuff's not too bad. I don't have an uns... Well, yeah, I do have unsigned character because the C compiler has that built in. But we can say we have this stuff. So how are we going to actually go about and load and run an ELF file instead of just a flat binary? Well, a flat binary, assuming the text section is loaded first, sort of at virtual address offset zero in the file, you just jump to that as an entry point, right? Well, if you have something like a portable executable or an ELF file here, they can specify their entry point, like entry here, or they have ways to specify and, and you know, run it. You can also look up main in the... If you know what the, the name of your function, like main and C is, you can look it up in the simple table, which I'm not going to do because it's more work. <laughs> but that probably would be how you normally find and jump to main. But I'm going to assume the entry point is correct. Hopefully it is. If not, I'll debug that later. But if it doesn't outright tell you, you can look up the symbol in a special symbol table and jump to that if you load it to uh, the entry point address. But uh, for an ELF file specifically, it tells you the program header offset and the overall file. So we'd go to this location after we load our object or our exe to memory. So our, our calculator.bin will load it to memory. The P, phoff here, the program header offset, will go to this location within that memory, and that'll be an array of program headers here. So since I did, you know, the read elf dash h, For the calculator.bin, for example, we have this many program headers. This is the size of the ELF header, 52 bytes, which will be, you know, this eHeader info. The program headers, the size is 32 bytes, the number is 8. So this should be 32 bytes, right? Before 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, 32. Yeah, so that's accurate. It's 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 20, 32, 36, 40, 44, 48, 52 plus that. So I probably calculated wrong, but anyway. The array of program headers has the have these fields in them in each array element. So what this tells you is the type of program header. I'm gonna be only dealing with type PT load, so loadable program headers. And it tells you where at within the file that this part of the program is. It'll tell you what virtual address it should be at. Uh, what physical address it should be at, although I'm not going to mess with that really. How large this section of the file is, how large it is in memory, which can be larger than the physical size of it. So if that's for zero padding. So if you have a section of your program that's like 2000 bytes, but it only actually takes up 1000 in bytes, then these two would differ by 1000. You'd load 2000 bytes for this section of the program, and it would just be zero padded, or you would explicitly zero pad that. So it doesn't really store it within the program object, but you can, when you load it, have that um, have that memory allocated for it. So it'll take up less space on disk until you load and run it. Um, we'll have flags, which are probably readable, writable, executable, stuff like that. And we'll have the alignment that it should go at. So usually this is, this is probably a multiple of, um, of the page size on your disk, like 4K or something. Um, but it's not too bad. So really, we just look for the program header offset from the ELF header. We go there according to how many program headers we have and according to how big they are. So the ph num and the ph uh, entity size. We go to that offset. It'll be an array of program headers. We go through each one of those headers and we see, you know, where it expects to be and how large it is. And we load each section to its specified address. And although as an extra, given I'm making explicitly portable executable files, dynamic files, they can be wherever, effectively, we don't necessarily need to follow where the entry point is or where it says to put them in memory. What we can do is calculate a relative offset, which portable executable PE files on Windows do, given their, their RVA values. We can calculate that on our own for these ELF program header sections and say, okay, if we load this whole file to, I don't know, 10,000, as an address in memory. If our V address for a program section is 200, then we can calculate that as an offset from the start of memory that we loaded the whole file into. And we can calculate doing that a relative virtual address in, a, in PE parlance. And we can load our sections to wherever in memory as long as we keep that relative offset consistent. And that's also true for the entry point. We'll also have to make that a relative offset as well. 
Doing that and using position independent executables, we can then load our program anywhere in memory and it doesn't need to be at a fixed location. So that's why I'm doing that. It's a little bit more flexible and a little bit easier, I think, to do that. And I think it'll make things a little better for the future. So hopefully it does. We'll see. But that's what I'm going to try to go with. So we can do that. I guess I can try printing the data first and see if we have, you know, valid data or not. As far as the elf section stuff, we can print it out like the read elf, uh, the read elf program rather, and try to do that. All right, so let me look in the kernel here where I'm going to actually load the stuff. There we go. <laughs> Forgot how Vim's uh, Control W keybinds worked, but uh, let me add this at the top of the kernel. Actually, might as well include elf and elf.h. So I can put it after the test functions or before or somewhere. I can move it into some other thing that's linked in later. Not like the professional website, quote unquote. I'll put it before the test stuff, I guess, after the init functions here. So I need to determine what type of file it is and then we'll load the file. So I'll put that down there and where I'm loading the stuff, which is here in the kernel, we found out it's a bin file instead of, I'll mess with that in a second, instead of uh, doing this stuff, right, explicitly getting the number of pages to load the program, setting a specific entry point, allocating the pages, deallocating them after doing all that, and loading it. I want to just call, you know, open <laughs> and set an entry point to where open was loaded to and then jump to that. So it'll be a little bit simpler, although the implementation for loading the elf will be a little more complex. But the other stuff will still be true, and I'll still do the other things. Uh, okay, free up the memory after. So I won't have to free this. I'll have to free the malloc memory, but I won't have to do this either. If I call close, right? Move this when done. Running elf. Program. Exe. So I have a return code we call, that's fine. I do want to call like open and close ultimately for like an FD. But I guess I'll see if we actually get the elf first, if we actually load it and open it and all. So, okay, if we get the file and it is valid, it has an inode, instead of getting the number of pages, I'll do something else right now. Maybe we'll say this is debugging so I know to remove it later. We'll say determine what type of executable this is. So we'll do that. So let's determine what type it is. So we loaded it to memory, or we are we need to load it to memory. So I need to probably do that first. And to do that, I'm just going to call open on that, which I think, well, I have that at the bottom, I know that. <laughs> Test open close, I just do this, so I'll do that here. All right, we'll get a file descriptor, and we'll call it, and I think this is a path. So inode from path argv0, so let's do that, argv0. Or I can give another name to it. Hmm. Maybe exe name. Just so I don't have to use argv0 anymore. So I don't need to do ocreate. I'll open it for readable and, and writable? No. <laughs> I don't remember. Is it just in syscalls? Syscall.h? Well, that's the overall syscalls, isn't it? Maybe I need numbers. I think in one of these files I have... Uh, these, the, uh, the open flags. That's what I was looking for, the open flags. So I don't think I really have an exe, an executable sort of flag that I'm setting. So I guess I'll open it for reading and writing. I'm not doing too much with those anyway. 
So we'll just say it's for readable and writable right now. That's that's fine. And that should load it all to memory according to how the open syscall works. My implementation of that, it just it gets all the pages needed for the file and it loads it to an area in memory according to what virtual memory is next available, which I don't think I have a virtual memory map set up. I should do that in the future. That would be a lot more robust. Anyway, let's assume we opened it and we have it at some section in memory. How do I determine what type it is? Well, the first few bytes of that file in memory should be a magic number saying what type of file it is. So MZ for a, a DOS EXE or the, uh, the portable executable, and 7F ELF for an ELF in this case, or nothing or gibberish for a flat binary. But how do I do that? I don't necessarily remember how I do that <laughs> with my OS. So let me go back to syscall open. So I remember how to do this. We should have the open file table. We can offset from that to get the sort of file table entry for this. And then we can go into there because that'll have something for the inode this is located at. I believe. So I know I allocate stuff down here, right? Yes. Where do I allocate that to? The address. Okay. All right. Going back to this after many months is like, I don't, I barely remember things, which is not great. <laughs> but other than the inode, something has the address. Yeah. Okay. So the file table, the file table entry has the address at which the file is loaded to. Okay. So ultimately, we can set and jump to an entry point from within there, and we can look at the data starting at that address according to, because that'll be where the file was loaded, that should have the magic bytes. All right. So I should be able to offset from that too by FD, that would be where the file is. I guess I can check what open returns as well, if it's negative or not. I think it's set the negative one. So we can do that first. If FD is less than zero, that's an error. So could not load file, we'll say S. Or I'll say could not load program or something. Could not load program S, which would be exe name, and then we'll continue. Otherwise we'll get here, let's say, well, I already have while one there, don't I? Let's just see if that loads starting off. All right, it does. I did not get a negative one. Okay. So open file table FD, that is a pointer, I think. Open file table, that's inode table. Yeah, that is a pointer, so I should have to dereference that probably. Although it does this. Yeah. And that's a struct, so I need the arrow, and we can look at the address. So we'll just say uh, program loaded to address percent %x. Just want to see where this stuff is loaded right now. So I can verify some things. Okay, so that's not right. Invalid type argument. Uh, because I'm dereferencing it, I'm dereferencing that by offsetting right here, right? So I probably need a dot for that. Yeah. Okay, so loaded address, that yeah, loads it to four, four meg anyway, so that's fine. I'm just not explicitly doing that anymore, like down here. Or actually it was four million, which is different, but anyway. All right, so what type of executable is it? We'll interrogate the bytes here. Let's say we have four bytes, we'll say magic. And that'll be an array and we'll put it at, well, I'll just do this so I don't get type errors for the fixed array size there. We'll put it at this location, right? So the address, I'll cast it to a character pointer or UN8 pointer. Doesn't really matter. And we can determine what that is. So 
We can do string compare. I'll do string in compare. We'll say, well, 7f isn't a valid thing, is it? Eh, that's fine. <laughs> I can do it manually. I can see if it's a PE or an ELF or something, right? PE has two bytes at the start for a, an old DOS header, M and Z. We can say if the first two letters are M and Z, I'll do that later. This will be a PE file. We'll say it's PE32 right now because I'm only dealing with dealing with 32-bit stuff. These need to be double equals. But if we have 7F and then EOF, and I know I have an ELF file. So we'll say PE32 executable. Else I'll say elf32. Okay, else we can assume it's gibberish or just a flat binary that I can still support later on. Okay, so we can see how that gets along. Uh, and again, I had the arrow there. Okay, loaded to that address. Elf32 executable. All right. So we know the first four bytes are there, so I know I loaded the thing to the address correctly. That's nice. I just had an N there. Yep, with the carriage return, so that looks a little bit better. So Elf32, so let's do to-dos here. And make sure I don't have to do this other stuff down here. Remove when done. Loading. Running elf. Because we already load and we already allocate all the pages as part of the open system call. I don't want to do extra work by doing all of this. Malloc, we do need the setup and teardown. And this we do need as well. Malloc is fine. I won't have to do this either, though. Okay, so I'm going to have a different, probably a, a function at the bottom, right? That I called load L4 something. Well, I don't have it right now, but I'll, I'll have something there. So we'll say load elf file. And we'll have it return, say, the entry point to the elf file, right? As maybe like a void pointer. So I have this here as an entry point. Um, let me remove that and say we'll go up here and do that. So I don't have an entry point made. We'll say we just have this. I will set that up here as well. Reset the malloc stuff, we'll have a return code. I guess I'll put that after again. <laughs> I won't have a return code. We'll do that after we do that. Okay. So let's give this whatever address we loaded the file to. I'll put within here. Because I know I have an elf file here. And I'll have that return. An entry point. So let me... I guess I can... I don't know. <laughs> eh, I can do that here. Can I program equals, uh, it'll be what, int star. This is kind of an awkward way of doing it. Let's not do that. I'm trying to think, I had a brain fart. Um, I, don't, I want to do that. I'm just like, how do I do it and cast the result of this to that? <laughs> because I'll say it returns like a void pointer. 
Uh, we'll just say this is going to be, I'll do this. We'll have void pointer entry, entry point, that'll equal whatever we load the out file. So what am I gonna pass to that? Um, probably the address that I loaded it at, which would be this. So I'm gonna have to make, well, I'm gonna have to load pages for the thing anyway, actually. <laughs> I'm going to need another buffer, if you will. So I have a buffer for the L file itself, but I need to load the sections from that file and fix them up a little bit and, you know, jump to the entry point. So I'll need another separate buffer. Maybe you could do all this with one buffer, but I'm not smart enough right now to figure out how to do that. That's all right. And we'll say, uh, run, run the executable. We'll run it from the entry points. So we have program here, but we'll need to do sort of int 32t pointer. Entry point. And I know I need to pass it argc and argv. I guess it'd be this. That would be double, so that's not right. So I need to surround it, probably. Probably do that. That does look jank. I feel like that's how you do it, though, because I'm casting it. Implicit declaration. Yep, I know I don't have that yet. Void pointer from int makes pointer from int without a cast. Okay, unused. All right, uh, let's make the load elf thing here, which is what I called it. Yeah, load elf file, okay. It'll return a void pointer. We'll have load elf file, it'll be taking in whatever the address is, which should be 32 bits. I don't remember, is it a pointer, is it not a pointer? Who knows? It's a UNAT address, okay. Which is fine. So this will be, we'll say, file address. And on some occasions I'll return null, on others I won't. Which is in a non-void function. Uh, does it not have null? Null undeclared, I don't have null yet. Um, it's probably within standard def, which I don't think I have, so actually I can do that. Oh, I can do that as well as part of this, so okay. Include C, we'll have standard def.h. Which would be a new, oh, I made that as a directory. Uh, <laughs> didn't want to do that. You can just do this. No longer available. I know, it's a new file. I don't know why it's not recognizing this as a C file. Doesn't have it. Ah. <laughs> Trying to do too much stuff at once. Standard def. Alright, it wasn't recognizing it as like a C file before, but that's alright. I'll just put standard definitions. Okay, so null uh, was traditionally defined as, you know, void pointer to zero, so that's what I'm going to define it as, just so there's something there. And that gives me a bunch of other issues. We still need load elf file, uh, which means I need it at the top because it's going to be after the other stuff, but... That's here. All right, so I'm going to copy that, put it at the top above the testing stuff. We'll say that's UNAT pointer. Right now it returns a null. Okay. So I don't remember how to do function pointers because I never remember, even though I had it before. 
but I got rid of what I had before, but I do it at the end of third stage, so void. Oh, I need extra parens. Okay. Extra parens here. So in 32 pointer, and then int that, and that surrounds. Okay. So that might look better. Oh, but then if this is in 32, then I'm going to have to dereference that. <laughs> I have program. You know what? I'm going to put this here. Then I won't have to think about it and, conf and confuse myself too much. So. I'll do this. Entry points. And then I'll have 32t. Return code will equal... Program given arg c and arg v. Called object is not a function or function pointer. It's a void pointer. Expects other things as well. Oh, because I'm calling it with that. No, just do it for the entry point. Okay. Oh, because it goes to that. Gotcha. So I should just need that? No. I need a third level. Third level of parentheses there. No. I'm <laughs> struggle bussing. Okay, there we go. That's how you that's how you define it. Parenthesis and 32 with that, and then that. Okay, I had that to begin with, but I got rid of that because I forgot I was going to have to do that. Okay. All right, so let's go to load the elf file. And go back and break everything from malloc, I guess. If we don't malloc anything, this should be fine, because it's just going to say, uh, you know, this will just run through. We probably won't update the total pages if we don't use it, so that'll be all right. Okay, so we'll just go to load out file, and we'll figure out how to do this stuff. So let's do git program header offset from elf header. I'll need to figure out how much memory... To load this to, uh, let's say, I'll just put that, figure out, figure out needed memory to load elf uh, sections into, say max, needed memory, load program, Headers to, to buffer. So we need to figure out the memory to load all the sections into. We'll have a maximum amount of memory for that according to the virtual addresses and things within the virtual address and the memory size within each program header. So that should be an ascending order, otherwise we'll be able to figure out a min and a max range of memory. And we'll load a buffer for that memory, and we'll load the program headers into that buffer. Create buffer for file. Load program headers into buffer. Return entry points. Okay. So we'll do that. So elf, elf.h, and our elf header here, which is the start of the file, because the ident had the magic, and that was at the initial bytes in the file. Should be able to do that here. So elf32 e header. I'll just say e header. Well, we can dereference it. We can just make it a, a pointer here. Elf32 e header pointer to the address that was passed in. And we can get the offset. So we'll just print that out right now.
and do nothing. So let's say program header, we'll say offset, percent %x or d or whatever. I'll say percent %x, that's fine. This will be e header, e ph off. We can just print elf info out. So print elf info, I'll just do that. We'll have program header offset, or just all the stuff here. We can do like how the readelf.h.h .h thing works. We can look at the type, machine, version, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I'll just I'll just do that. See if we can print it out all as just one string buffer here. So we'll say the type should be D or U. We'll just say D here. We'll have the machine. For the machine, I might do hex. Version, I don't care. Entry, I will care about. Program header offset I will care about. We'll see just an integer for that. Flags, not really. Entry header size, maybe, or elf header size. And we can type these things out. So what else do we have? Program header entry size. And then maybe the number. Program header, I'll say num. The number of program headers. And that's all I'll do for now. Uh, undeclared does not like them. Um, yeah, because those are all from the E header. Okay, unused variable, undeclared, return code for what? Where is that at? 831, 95. Undeclared identifier needed pages, that's fine. If return code less than zero. Oh yeah, we'll have an error doing that. Um, I mean, I could move that out. I guess I will move that above here. Because I can reuse the variables for whatever type of program we're running. And we'll just do that. Uh, yeah, we'll just do that. Didn't want to do that, but okay. We'll go back to where that was. Okay, there we go. And it's unneeded. So let's see what that runs when I print out the info for, we'll just say calculator. All right, loaded that. I guess it won't be the program. I'll just say file loaded to address. It's an L32 executable. Info will be type 2, which I think is right, 32, not 64-bit. Machine is 3, I think that's correct. I don't know. <laughs> Entry, program header offset 52, elf header size 52 bytes. So right after the elf headers, the program headers here. Program header entry size 32 bytes each, and we have 8 of them. That seems correct. So does this say the P type? So the type we want to deal with is like dynamic or executable. Well, no, loadable for the program headers, but... All right, I want to do with executable or dynamic or stuff. Was it type 3? Is that what that said?
Yeah, the machine. The machine is three. The type is two. Okay, interesting. So the type would be exec, executable file. So that is all right. So I can put that stuff in here as well. I make it an enum. And I'll have et, et phone home. I'll do these et none unknown because it'll start at zero automatically for enums here, but I can do that explicitly by saying it's zero et all et rel et exec et dyn. These will be a few that we're going to deal with. I'm only going to be doing probably dealing with these right here. So we can have others later, right? If I deal with others. But uh, I'm only going to be dealing with sort of these three and mainly just executable or dynamic. Relocatable is more for objects, I think. So probably just EXEC or DYN if I can help it. So I'll say if uh, e header e type is not equal to exec or yeah, if it's not executable or dynamic type. Say error program is not an executable or dynamic executable. Yeah, I'll just say that. And we'll return null. Else we'll go and we'll get the other stuff. So we have the program header offset. That's in there. So we'll have to figure out this stuff. We'll have to figure out the maximum amount of memory to make a buffer for from looking at the program headers at that offset. So we'll do that. I think I also want to change change where I'm printing the info as well. This is not, that's PE. Yeah, that's fine. What am I trying to think of? Let's go back. I wanted to make it print a little bit better. ET, ET, DYN? Yeah, that's not right. Type def struct doesn't like that. Well, it doesn't like me doing this. Do I have to do a semicolon there? Probably. Yes. All right, what did I want to do? I think I wanted to get rid of this line here. I'll just put info. But that all seems correct for the most part. Yeah, just get rid of that. I'll just put info. Okay. We'll say, I don't know. You want 32, we'll say. I don't know, buffer size or something, memory size, and we'll print that out. Didn't want to do whatever I did there. Say memory needed for file percent %x. Buffer size, it'll start at zero, but that's all right. So how do we do that? Well, I know I have the ph offset, and I know I have the elf pe header as well. That's struct defined at the bottom here. So let me just put that whole thing over here, actually. So 
So that's where this is, right? We have the program header offset. That'll have an array of program headers according to however many we found in the phnum uh, field. And phint size will say how big they are. So I'll go through all of those and see. So how do I do that? I know I'll have the elf header. So I guess I, I'll just have an, another, another pointer to those. Yeah. So p header pointer will have program headers or prog headers. And that'll be the elf 32 p header pointer, not to the offset, but to wherever this was loaded, which is going to be the e header plus the offset, which is kind of what this is doing, but it's in whatever the the buffer that this file is loaded into at the, the file address at that base. So we can say file address plus, because that's a un8, plus this offset. So that offset into the file is where the program headers are, so I need a pointer to there to be able to read and go through the program headers correctly. We'll say program header, or I'll just say p header. That would be shorter. Okay, so we'll say for i is zero, i is going to be less than however many program headers we have, which is e, p, h, num. We'll go through all of those, and we can like print out info for them or something, uh, just in case. I'll do that. We only want to handle a certain number of types and only the loadable types, so I probably should add that in as well. I'll add that in at the bottom in an enum. Those will be pt. So I'll just say we have pt null, load, dynamic. I'm only going to worry about loadable segments. So it's what? et null? No, pt null. This will be E type values. Okay. So this will this will be loadable loadable section or loadable program header, loadable program section. Uh okay. So right now I'll say debugging. Well, it doesn't have to be. I'll print out print out the info. So p header, that'll point to the first one. So p header i will be the size of a program header at that address. And dereference will give the struct, so we can use a dot to get the info. So we'll say, uh, I guess we'll put that here. Program headers, I guess I'll do that. So let's print out the number that it is first. We'll have i, but we'll have other stuff after that. So we'll have the number, we'll have the type. Which I can also do d, that's fine. I might change to do this all in one line and not multiple, but it's easier to print it out right now. But the virtual address, that'll do an X for hex. Physical address probably doesn't matter. It might just be zero for all these, I don't know. It probably won't matter though, I'm going to be ignoring it pretty much. I guess we'll have offset as well. Type offset. We'll see if that can be integer or not. Physical virtual address, we'll have file size. So the size of this program segment. Uh, memory size, which can be bigger than the file size. So it'll be padded with zeros. We'll have flags. Flags won't really matter. I'm not going to look at them, but we'll, we'll print them anyway. And we'll have the alignment, which will probably be 4K, I would assume, or some power of 2. It might be like 2 or 4 or 8. Might be some power of 2. But that's fine. 
So p header i dot p type p offset p v adder p p adder p file size p memory size p flags and alignment. I think that's all. Okay. Okay. I want to get the other info too, but right now we'll do that. Just want to see what info is there. Assuming I type things correctly, which I don't. 35 is wrong. That's good to know. So I messed something up here, probably. That needs to have a comma. There we go. E underscore pH offset, that's true. I don't know where this other weird 35 line error is coming from. I guess I typed something wrong up here a second ago. That is all right. Or elf.h ends. Oh, elf.h ends without the semicolon, of course. The enum has to end with a semicolon, don't forget that. I just have null and load there right now. You can't see that under my head. All right. Mm, default exception handler. Program is not an executable or dynamic executable. Ooh. Interesting. So it broke with these, et exec or dyn. Should be exec, maybe not. Well, if it returns null, I'm not gonna mess with it, actually. Yeah, let me do that. <laughs> if not, entry point, or if it equals null, either one. Error could not load, I'll just say could not load elf file or get entry point. Right, we didn't malloc anything, so that's okay. Okay, else we'll run the executable. All right. Expansion of macro null to match this. What is the issue with that? Void pointer zero, yeah. I guess that's not how you define null. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, well, I can look at that. Uh, standard def. They define it as null pointer, but I'm not doing C++. Oh, they wrap it with extra parentheses. Ah, okay. Okay. Or I could just define it as zero, but I'll have a void pointer to zero. Why does it say I need extra ones, though? That's weird. An expansion of null. Why would it need that to match, though? That doesn't make sense. Um, <laughs> this is why you don't write a C standard library, because it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Do I not need the semicolon there? Is that is that the whole issue? Maybe. They don't have a semicolon. Maybe that's why. Maybe I don't need a semicolon. That would probably fix things, yeah. <laughs> it's always the little things. Always the little things. Okay. So this says it's, the type is two. It says it is not an executable or dynamic. I don't think that's correct. And I guess the program is not loaded there. It's more like file loaded. Files loaded there. Oh, I said or. I need to do and. <laughs> it is not an. It's not an executable, and it's not a dynamic. That would be, yeah. Not, don't do an or because it can be one or the other. It's not going to be both at the same time. I don't think. Okay, so it's printing them out. 
Um, I'll probably print it all out on one line so it doesn't do that, but you can see we have, we'll have zero through seven because there's eight total headers. The last one has, I don't think the type is correct. <laughs> Some of these seem like they're incorrect, but anyway. We can fix that if we actually print out the right stuff, right? Let's do this. We'll have number. Number, type, offset. Vert address. Vert address, fizz address, size. Yeah, probably, I can probably print it all out on one line. That'll be okay. All right, size, flags, alignment. Then we'll have I and all that, okay. Okay, so program headers, we have types. I guess I want to, I'll ignore it if it's not a loadable type. Yeah, because I'm not interested in anything but the loadable types. So I actually, I'll change to do that. But we do have some info here. One should be loadable. So you have a four, which isn't loadable. The addresses that they're at, according to where the buffer was at, which is where this entry is as well. That's offset from here and into here. Size, memory size, flags, okay. Yeah, I'm only interested in the ones that are loadable. Only interested in loadable program sections. So if the type is not equal PT load, then we'll continue. Need a comma there. I'll just have it be a little more succinct here. Number, type, offset, vert adder, fizz adder, file size, memory size, mem size, flags, alignment. We'll just do that. And of course, if I know it's a loadable type, I don't need to print the type, but that's fine. A little redundant. But that's okay. Alright, virtual address, physical address. So these are the same. I guess they're always going to be the same for these. Maybe. Maybe not. File size. Memory size could be larger for these. Yeah, see for this one, for example, the last one here, the memory size is larger than the file size by about 140 bytes. So I'll have to pad that with zeros. And they each have a 4KB alignment of 1,000 in hex. So that makes things simple enough. I need to know the buffer. Let's say we have a minimum and a max. So let's say memory min and memory max. Uh, max, we'll say, is right now it's UN32 that I'm dealing with. So one, two, three, four. And then the minimum is going to be zero. Right, and I'll also probably want to align things. So how do we do that and determine that kind of stuff? Um, I'll have to figure that out. <laughs> min, min will equal something, and max will equal something. So we'll say... I don't remember. I got to look up how to do this, so I'll be back because <laughs> I forget because I can check these, but I need to I need to look that up again because I forgot off the top of my head and I'll test some things and I'll get back to you when I figure this out. I got to take a break anyway. So thanks for watching so far. Hopefully this isn't too boring, but yeah, <laughs> be back in a sec. OK, so refilled some water, <laughs> took a break. So all right, so I want to determine 
I want to determine how much memory to load the program headers into by going through their info here. So I got mem, min, and max. These program headers have an alignment value. I will also use that to determine things. And from what I looked at, they're all, or from what I printed, they're all 4K aligned, which is nice anyway, but we'll have something for that regardless. So let's say we have, we have an alignment value here, which I'm going to have be the page size, which I think I should have. It'll be 4096 for mine, but that's fine. I have a page size here, and I'll have a different one within here, maybe. Actually, let me make, that'll be the initial alignment, and we'll have one that can update as well. So, which I will set it to. If it's larger, we can set it to a larger alignment, but I'll start it off with this. So, okay, let's set that. Let's update max alignment as needed. So we'll say if the alignment is less than what the program header says. If my pinky works and I can type, which I can't. Uh, then I'm going to make it that alignment. Okay, so if we have a header that's aligned on like a 2K boundary for some reason, I want to make the alignments of that <laughs> type. And since these are an increasing, well, yeah, the ELF spec sort of defines the program headers to be an increasing order as far as I think virtual address, um, we should have the largest alignments, you know, before the, the next ones. And anyway, we, this should work out to where this will be okay if we read them in order. I'm just... I want to, I'm trying to think if we'll have an issue where the alignment could be too small, but that might be something I don't have to worry about for a long time. So we'll just say we'll update the alignment as needed and we'll get the minimum and maximum memory specified by all of the program headers here, all the loadable, specifically loadable program headers. So, okay, I should use probably the V address or the P address for that. Okay, so let's say if we're given the virtual address. Huh. I think, all right, so let's say we have a beginning and end here. Let's say mem begin. Begin mem and begin end. All right, beginning is gonna be the virtual address. So I begin and end, end will equal For this specific program header, how much memory does it say it takes up? So it'll start at wherever the virtual address is, and it'll end at the virtual address plus the memory size, plus whatever our alignment value is. Yeah, plus whatever the alignment value is. Since it's zero-based, we can subtract one off of that. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna limit this to the alignment for the section as well. So we can and with not of align minus one. So that'll be all Fs, right? So what that'll do is something like I can show it within I can show it within binary. So if we output as binary and we input as hex, and our alignment is four thousand and ninety six, then I can print that out as all bits, right? Is that right? That's probably not right. 16 input. Yeah, it should be a thousand in, in hex, right? Well, I guess it doesn't have to be, though. We can input as decimal with 10i. We can just say 4096. Yeah, so as, as binary, those are all the bits that are set right. So if we do 4095, then all the bits below this, I'll just all these zeros are flipped to ones, and we lose the top one. So if we AND with that value, we're limiting to the amount that can be within the alignment. So that's what this is doing here, the page size or otherwise if it's larger. All right, and then we can see, I guess memory min and max I'll put up here. The minimum and maximum. So the max is gonna be, oh, I already set it up here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the max is gonna start at the UNT32T max. So however big that is. So if the beginning is less than the minimum, I guess, or the minimum is less than that, then we'll go up to it. 
All right, let me re let me reverse these actually. Let me reverse these. Okay. So if I re yeah, if I reverse the boundaries here, we can say if we find a program header that's less that starts at a position less than this, then we'll decrease the minimum, and if it ends at a position greater than this, we'll increase the maximum. All right. So it's a little maybe counterintuitive there, but let me do that. I'm a little frazzled today. I'm always frazzled. So sorry if I'm acting confused. It's because I am. So we'll have this and we'll say our minimum memory, right? If the, if the begin part of this memory for this program header is less than our minimum, we want to make that the new minimum, right? Get new minimum memory for all program headers or all program sections. And we want to get the max. So I'll say get new minimum and maximum, say memory bounds maybe, that might make more sense. So we'll do that and then the end is going to be address plus the memory it takes up up to the alignment after that memory. After the size starting at this base and then the alignment after that to ensure there's enough room before the next program header starts. So we'll do that as well. Bound it by the alignment values. I could do that here, I suppose. That, that should be the same thing, right? But let me make sure this is right first. <laughs> so if mem uh, end is greater than our maximum and it starts at zero up here, so it will be to start off with, then we'll make that the new maximum. Okay. And then at the end we can use that to get the total amount of memory that we need. So let's say the buffer size that we need is going to be max minus min. And we can print that out. And that should be okay. Okay, so for this file, specifically for all the program headers, we need uh, 6 times 4K, so 24K in space. So that's not too bad, though. That's a pretty small file, all things considered. So we know how much we need. We should be able to allocate a buffer and load it to there. Uh, which would be a void pointer by default. So I'll fix this up later, but right now we'll say we have an entry point to be at that location. I do have stuff equally null, don't I? No, I can return null. But am I not checking directly against? I'm checking directly against that. Okay. I should be able to do like, if not entry point though. Eh. It might be better if I did if not entry, but that's fine. We'll do that. Print an error out just in case if I need to right there. So error will say could not malloc enough memory for uh, for program. All right, we'll see if that worked. And it did, it malloced the memory, okay. So load program headers into a buffer, we have to go back through and load all the things again. So I'll copy that, I won't print out the info again, but I'll just copy that actually. Only interesting. <laughs> Only interested. That's that's English, right? Only interested. Okay, so what do we do? We need to load the data to its specified position within the buffer according to what it says it needs. So since this buffer will be at a different position. Uh, one, from where the file is loaded to begin with, but two, it'll be different from the program headers that it specifies, like its virtual address. 
it'll be different, but since this is a position independent executable that I'm only dealing with, then I don't really care. <laughs> we can just, we can make it at the specified offset within its header section from wherever the file was loaded and just reposition it as long as that offset is consistent. So if, if the virtual address for this, you know, is a thousand bytes above where the overall file was loaded at this file address, then the, we'll say relative virtual address is going to be a thousand bytes into the file. And so we can load it at any specific point as long as we keep it a thousand bytes from that point, right? So dynamically relocatable, if you will, in some level. So let me get that first. So let's say relative, we'll say relative offset. Not great, but that's all right. P header I dot P V adder. So we'll get the virtual address and it'll be minus wherever this started, which will be file address. Although the file address is a pointer and the virtual address is not. So let's do that. So as long as we have that, we'll have wherever we can put the file and we need to load it into wherever our buffer is, which is this entry here. I'll call it buffer probably. That makes more sense. Buffer size for a buffer. So we'll do something like min copy, which I do have, I think. I don't remember all what I have. <laughs> Include C string .h. I should have min copy. Yeah, dest source and length, okay. Dest source and length. So the destination, well, I know what the source is gonna be, and I know what the length is gonna be. So the source is gonna be our p header virtual address into the file but I guess that needs to be offset from the start, which would be the file address. Uh, it will be file address plus that, right? Which is, that's a UN8, that should be okay. No, I'm doing this, um, I'm doing this wrong, kind of. It's given an offset. Okay, the offset, I think, uh, is what I need to use. <laughs> Painful. The offset holds the offset from the beginning of the file. Okay. So we'll read from the offset in the file. We'll read into a virtual address, which is going to be a relative address from wherever the start of the section needs to be at a new point. We'll read the memory size amount of data, not file size, because memory could be as big or bigger, so we can just look at this and implicitly have it be zero aligned. Since we got the maximum amount of memory we would need, that's fine. Uh, we did the alignment. So we'd read the memory size amount of data from the offset in the original buffer into the new buffer at a given virtual address. I think that's what I need to do. That makes sense. So read in the mem size amount of data from the offset into original file buffer to uh, PV address offset by relative amount into new buffer. Okay, that's what we need to do. I can do this to make more sense, maybe. Okay, and we have the length. So the length is going to be P mem size, ultimately. So I'll do that here. You header I P mem size. So we won't do this for source. But I'll do that. I guess they use three letters, right? Dest and source. This source mem size, okay. And length, but this will be the length. Okay, so that P offset, 
from the original, which will be file address. We'll put that in for source. And then the dest. I guess it would, it might read a little bit better if I do source and length. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Because it's less for me to mess up <laughs> if I write it out explicitly like that. I need to read it into the relative offset there into the new buffer. So it'd be buffer, which is void pointer. So let's do uint a t pointer buffer plus the relative offset, which will be where it originally was minus the original offset. Yeah. Okay. So buffer plus that. Source would be address plus that. Okay, that makes sense. In PE files, this would be an RVA. So use relative position of program section in file. This would be to ensure it still works correctly. <laughs> kind of a cop-out answer. With PIE executables, this means we can use any entry point or addresses as long as we keep the same relative addresses. I'll say use. I'll say should. Should be equivalent to the RBA. Okay, didn't mess anything up there. So the entry point also needs to be a relative offset. So let's say we have entry. The entry point would be the entry point in the file. Well, in the header, rather. We have that in the header here. Entry. So E entry. That should be the entry point address of the overall file. So that is called, I'll just copy that. But we need to offset that by a relative position. So I don't remember if that's a pointer or not. I think that's just a 32-bit number. So what I have to do is subtract that from the position in the original file address to also get the RVA, the relative offset for that. And that would get a new entry point, so... So let's do that. So that equals e header, or the, the e entry minus the address. But that needs to be a sort of void pointer. This will be a 32 bit number. We'll cast that to a, an address. Say that's the entry point, and we'll return that as the address. That should be okay. Also needs to be uh, relatively offset from the start of the elf buffer. Original, say original elf buffer. And that should be the entry point. Okay. Taking me a while, but I'm getting there. So we have the data in the elf header. We have all the program sections, which the elf header says where they are. We have the data for those. We get the maximum amount of alignment and memory that would take. We make a new buffer for that amount of memory, and we load the we load the program headers into that new buffer, that new memory, according to where they're positioned in the original file. 
And given their alignment values, that shouldn't matter. But according to where they are in the original file, each section says where it's at and says how big it is. So where it's at in the original file and how large it is, we load into the new file according to the same relative offset it was at in the original file. I think that makes sense. I think that's correct. But that would return an entry point. And we would load that, and then we would run that. So right now, let's make sure it gets to that point. And I doubt it'll work. Oh, page fault. That's wonderful. <laughs> of course, there would be a page fault. Okay, so that's before this point, because we don't have an infinite loop. So... Program equals the entry point, which is loaded from here. We did not get null. I'm assuming it's where the elf file is loaded or where I'm putting the memory in. Like here. Probably there. It's this offset. It's probably this mem copy. I don't see why it wouldn't be this mem copy. But I'll just make sure. And now those are unused variables. That's true. Yeah, it's that mem copy. Okay. Uh, well, I do need the buffer plus the offset. I guess I'll print out what those are to see what's going on. I said, hey, why are you getting a page fault? What's going on? Didn't like it. Need a semicolon there. Alright, what's wrong with this? Oh, the destination is not correct. Well, we're loading other memory there. That should be alright. Yeah, we loaded it to this address. I guess because the entry point's way up in the air, that data's not, that file's not right. Yeah, we're getting all the data from there. That seems correct. So that's the memory sizes there. This is 1k above that. This is a few above that. I could do it all in hex. That might make more sense. Yeah, this is over a thousand in hex, so it had to do another 1,000 after for the alignment value. That's why that's two above. And then there, that seems correct. Maybe it's not though. Let's see, let's see if the first one works. No, it doesn't work at all. Okay, so the pages at 8,000 are not correct, or they're not mapped in, or whatever. I guess malloc doesn't map those in, so that makes sense. Since I did call open, I'd have to use another address. Um, to make sure it's actually readable, writable in our in our paging system. So that makes sense. So the first one was because I did open where I first load the elf file. Yeah, right here. So I probably need to do that again and call close when it's done, to be fair. Close file when done. But I would also need to do that when this returns. I guess I'll include that. I could malloc this file and do open on the actual executable that we run and return stuff for. Or I could call open on the other thing, but I have to remember to close it. That's why I'm concerned. Because I have to, I have to sort of propagate either the file descriptor or I, I'm returning the entry point for the file, but I don't know if I open it. I have to, you know, then close that, but I won't have the data after this load function is called. So I can free the memory for entry point. 
but I probably should have that be open instead, actually. So load elf file can call open right into that buffer, but then I have to close the file later. I'm just thinking, how do I do that? Uh, I could return two things in a struct, and that would kind of bypass it. I could return the file descriptor and the entry point as a struct from this function, and that would accomplish that goal. So maybe I'll do that. And I'll need a type up here for that. Like this. Or I could put it with an elf or, or what have you. Um, I mean, I could have it just be a type, though. I should probably move it out later, but that's all right. I don't know, FD and entry. <laughs> Uh, ILFD entry point. Not a great name. But that's all right. So we'll have file FD and entry point. I'll just say file info for a lack of better term right now. So file if file info dot entry point is null, we'll do that. Otherwise, we'll do this. File info dot entry point. Okay. And get a return code. Close FD. So this will be file info dot FD. Um, or no, no, it won't. That'll be this one. That one's okay. Yeah, the file info, the one that was loaded, will do. We want to close the original one too. Close files when done. So let's do that as well. And I want to free the memory because if I go back to it, I am calling malloc for the buffer. Which will be calling free on file info dot, um, dot entry point. Well, not even dot entry point it needs to be dot it needs to be for the buffer. Hmm, well that's not great. I might need a global for that. Uh, let's let's uh, let's do that. Uh, just call it file buffer, program buffer, exe buffer. I'm overcomplicating this too much. <laughs> that's okay. So instead of freeing that, we'll free the exe buffer. I do need to know what the file is, though, so I will have to close that. So I think that's okay. And we will pass back an entry point and the FD, so I think that's all right. But the exe buffer will be loaded there, yeah. But it'll return a new struct, which has the FD and the entry point. We'll close that at the end, free the memory for the buffer. The entry point doesn't need to be freed because it'll be part of the buffer, but we'll get the entry point from here and use it there. Okay. So where I have the buffer, will be exe buffer. Okay. Actually I need to put it there. Exe buffer and there. All right. Or wait, I could call open and open would have read write. I don't remember. <laughs> oh, I'm confusing myself. All right, open. I don't remember everything I've done. It's been too long. I just call it with that. Do I set like readable writable for the file when I load it? I set read write. Okay. I do set read write. So, but I don't want to call open on it because that's not going to work. But I do have to map in the data, don't I? So the buffer would have to be, since it's part of an alignment value, I would have to change this actually. Instead of doing a malloc, which doesn't have necessarily the readable, writable, or executable flags and whatever, I probably should map in the flat, the uh, the data for that. So I have to call like map page or map pages. I don't want to do that though. Or maybe it does work by default, but I just am getting some memory address way out in the other that doesn't work for this for whatever reason. I think this code is right, mostly. This gives a page fault. Fix it. I 
Which I don't need to do that. Turn entry, that's probably okay. Yeah, and I will have to free that because I'm malloc'ing it here, okay. So I don't know if the issue is because I don't have the right readable, writable, executable flags for the malloc to buffer, or if the buffer is like invalid memory for some reason and reading into it generates the page fault from that. Could be. But I don't want to have to call map pages again and do all that stuff, but I might have to. <laughs> but I can't call open because the file the file is made, but the buffer is not going to be the same size. But that would set up the flags. But I can't call open because that just makes an FD. I guess I could call open and then that would be generic 4K, but I'd have to map additional pages to that. No, and the buffer would be dynamic, so I do kind of have to do this. But I did malloc the buffer, so I'm not returning a new FD, actually. So I'm not doing open, so I don't have to do what I was thinking. So I don't have to do this. I will make the buffer global, though. But I don't have to do that. Because we'll just return the entry point. That's, that's fine. We won't, we won't call open for that. We'll just close the original, free the memory. Mm, file info and declare, that's fine. Okay. Hmm. So this does not work. Get an error code at that address. That address does seem pretty high. Not reading that many bytes into it, but that's where malloc went to. Maybe because I'm calling that before I'm loading it? Am I messing up because of that? Because I did change this stuff, didn't I? And I'm calling malloc, so that's probably why. That's probably why, or part of it. So let's do that before I call it. And then after we'll have reset it. Yeah, we'll reset it after to this stuff. Okay. That's probably why, or at least part of it. Uh, list. Okay, yeah, because in the original setup, before everything's running, I'm initializing the malloc variables to where the kernel ones are. All right, so those would those would have had invalid values. That that kind of makes sense. We don't want to reset those until we're gonna actually run the program. Print that out as a sanity check as well. Free memory for exe. Close. Original. Well, yeah, I'll just say close file buffer when done. No, just close file. Yeah, and that handles the buffer from loading it. Okay. Oh, trying to keep it all straight in my head is not working. <laughs> that would make sense, though. Okay, still broken, but the the uh, the mem copy is different this time. That's interesting. We'd have to know the file would have to exist and be made for that, uh, which is not great. All right, what if I do like map page? I have to map physical to a virtual address. Okay, or maybe I could set the attributes for a page. <laughs> maybe that's not being done. I thought malloc does that though. If I call malloc and it sets read and write. Yeah, these are all readable writable when they're malloced. So actually, I shouldn't have to worry about that. Interesting. So, why is this giving a page fault? Shouldn't be. For memcopy, well, I could do 32 bit as well, but for memcopy. It's just saying destination equals the source. 
These are void pointers, so that's fine. We're given length, so is that not correct? This was malloc buffer plus the offset, which is gotten from this, and that file address is passed into this program. Yep. Oh, I guess P header isn't at the right location anymore. That's probably why. Well, that would be part of why. This isn't at the right location anymore, so... So I'm going here. Where do I set that up? Here? Yeah. <laughs> I iterate through all of these, right? But then the program header would be after all of those, so that might be part of it. That might be reading an invalid memory. That would make sense. I have to reload that value to where the program headers are, because <laughs> I didn't reset it before. That would probably be different. That makes sense. you got to reset to read through the headers again. Oh, it's always something. I probably missed like 10 other issues. Yeah, well that's that didn't change anything actually, interestingly enough, because I'm just offsetting from that. Yeah. Now that wouldn't have made a difference because I'm offsetting from that point with I, so never mind. That is an interesting destination address though. Source is nice. Um, I mean what I could do is also zero in it the whole buffer as well. Just to ensure that it's all zeros, which is what I need to do as well. For and then buffer size. That would help. That's something I would have had to do anyway. Okay, now it's pink for some reason instead of red, but whatever. <laughs> I don't know what my issue is. I'm going to have to debug this and see what the problem is. I don't I don't know. Uh, okay, I'm going to be back when I figure this out. All right, so I fixed it. I had some issues with getting the right memory addresses and everything, of course, and I went through some debugging. Uh, since the malloc pages are readable, writable, I won't need to do this. I, had, I just went through the pages and set them as readable, writable for the buffer. I don't need to do that because malloc is already. Um, I did add the program buffer address. I'm going to keep that, actually. So I put that before zero initting the buffer. Um, and I also set the entry point explicitly to get rid of that error that it can't find start, the start address. When I'm linking these exe files, I added the dash e main to the linker line so it knows where main is. So the int main argc argv will work as the entry point. Okay, so that fixes up, you know, that address a little bit. Uh, for that, I'll just show what this looks like before I go over my other couple changes here. Just so you know what it looks like here. I'm not running the file yet, I'm still stopping with a while one loop, but the address here was like C, you know, whatever, whatever, instead of where the kernel has its malloc starting at about three megs. So this is correct, right? It was like, instead of eight, this was a C, it was like way high in the clouds. You don't want to do that. That would be, that, that memory wasn't valid, is why I was getting those errors, those page faults. But with that, I do get the memcopy stuff, which looks correct, reasonably. Oh, if I can remember what I did. Okay, so <laughs> where we get the, the program headers and I'm setting where the memory begins and ends for the section and then for the overall executable, right? These are getting addresses. Okay. And these addresses are, you know, for this file that was input to load the elf file from. Well, it is the elf file, but the original buffer will say this elf buffer you know, I'm getting the memory inside of that elf buffer where it begins and ends, not within the sort of elf program header section that's offset from like 8 million or whatever. I'm getting within the elf buffer, 
you know, where that begins and ends here. So that's the memory I want to use within the elf file itself. I don't want to use the overall buffer that was passed in here because that's going to be some address that's uh, the alignment value and the offsets are going to be wrong. So that's why I had this line. This is wrong. Offsetting from this original address. I want to offset from wherever the program sections start because that's where the whole image is going to be. And the entry point will be after that minimum just by definition because the entry point is going to be within a runnable code section of the elf file and that'll be within one of the program headers. I don't want to offset from this file address passed in. I want to offset from wherever the start of the program headers is, uh, which I got up here, if that makes sense. That's not a great explanation, but that's the best I can think of right now <laughs> as I'm getting really tired. You know, so if it starts at zero, the minimum is going to be zero, and the relative address of that program header will be offset from zero. It won't be offset from like four million of this buffer that's passed in. So just, just want to set that point home. That's why it was wrong. It was getting, you know, the wrong addresses. So with, with that, I can offset that amount from the program section. Uh, in the original elf buffer, I can offset that same amount within this new buffer for the runnable executable. So I'm just adding that again. I didn't change this, but I'm adding that to the new buffer to get the same offset. And then the source is going to be the, the header's specific offset in the original buffer. But the virtual address that it goes into is offset from the start of all of the sections in this new buffer. So I'm bad at explaining, but that's kind of what that means. And that's why this then works and I don't get a page fault anymore because the addresses are correct. And then for the entry point, I wasn't doing that right anyway, but the entry point is also offset from the start of the program sections. So I'm just getting the entry point offset from the start of that. I'm adding that to the new buffer you know, casted so it has one byte uh, pointer arithmetic, and then I'm casting that to avoid pointer for the entry point that is being returned from this function. So instead of just getting the entry minus this, which that wasn't correct, I'm getting this, and that is the correct entry point. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Probably doesn't, but it doesn't to me at least. <laughs> it will in the morning when I like digest it in my brain a bit, but right now I'm still kind of confused, but okay. And then I didn't want to mess with malloc, so that's valid code. The buffer will be freed, so malloc is taken care of, and the file is taken care of as well. Okay. So we'll see if I can actually run it now. Probably won't be able to. I'll probably get an error maybe right here where I'm running the code. We'll see. We'll find out. Reset malloc before calling. I could do this here. Program, return code, print the return code. And we'll see just for example, if the calculator runs. Okay, yeah, I got a page fault again for something. Probably because I'm not running the mem copied address. I'm, I'm calling offset from wherever the file is. I need to offset from this buffer, right? Because that looks incorrect. Or it just keeps going on and I have an infinite loop somewhere. I don't know, but that's not correct. Let me just make sure it is at that point. It's probably because I reset it before I call it. The thing that I just changed. I'm not paying attention. Right, because I'm doing this before the entry point. Yeah, I need to not do this. Or do I? No, because this program is running in malloc space. No, but that's okay then, if I do that, because the program will malloc at wherever this is available at. Although I guess if calculator calls malloc, maybe that's messing things up. Because it probably is when it's printing stuff. That might be part of it. Oh, but do I get the entry point? Yeah, from the, from the malloc buffer. Yeah. So from this new buffer of 24k in size or whatever it is, I'm getting that entry point offset from so entry offset from min yeah exe buffer I could print the entry point address just to make sure that probably would be good probably would be good
just print out all the info. I'll just print it down there. Uh, oh, I'm doing that. Sorry. Can't give a halt loop to print the info out. It doesn't work. All right, entry point 308. So I should be jumping to that entry point. But this is a lot above that, right? And that's at wherever the original file thing is, which is not correct. So maybe I have to do this. I have to increment that or something. Because that's overriding where the elf file was. I don't know. Probably. Maybe this is wrong. Uh, this is painful. <laughs> I'm so close, yet so far. Next available vert address. I'll just say next malloc vert address. This will be next available file virtual address. Okay. I don't know why. This is a big number, actually. No. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8. Yeah, so I think it's something to do with mallocking when I call the program. Because the entry point's a lot below that. So why would it be doing that? Hmm. Shouldn't be using data I don't need. I'm only using the loadable program sections. Interactive true, that, I don't know why that has a new tag on it. Because I didn't get rid of them last time, probably. I think I went over all this stuff last time, right? <laughs> probably just didn't delete them. Change that to octal, that's alright. Print new line for results. Interactive, yeah. Okay, anyway, I think it's because I'm I'm printing stuff which necessitates using malloc within printf. And it's giving me like an invalid address for that? Maybe. I know I'm not using the link using the linker scripts anymore either, because I feel like I shouldn't need them. So probably something to do with that. If I just had it return immediately. I suppose I could check. All right, we'll just return zero. Well, I'll return 42, so we know what the return code is. So we'll see if that happens. We get something wrong from that. Okay. I know I can call, so <laughs> to prove a point, I know I can load elf files and call them because this did work and it returned correctly. But mallocking within there is giving me issues. That's reasonable. I'll get rid of that. Okay. That's reasonable. But I can load it and run it and it does return. And we print the return code. I'm assuming this stuff is good. We free the buffer and we close that. That seems okay. So my issue is within the files when I'm calling, probably probably print F when I get the line of input here. So if I return right there. Yeah, that's okay. Let's see after the first print F. That's okay, so what is the issue then? Get key? No, because the, the other time it just did that immediately. Arc C is not greater than one. I could check if it works in batch, because it seems the interactive one's the, the bad one.
right? That does that before anything happens. I feel like that's with a git key, but this worked. Oh, printf debugging is the best. There's relatively quick turnaround times. Yeah, nothing happens. Okay, so git key is wrong? Interesting. Or printing this when it returns is bad. I don't know. Hmm. I mean, I have some stuff up here. Probably don't want to do this as like static or global anymore. If I'm just printing that anyway, why does it matter? I'm just printing syntax error, like... I can at least clean that up. Oh, it still doesn't work. Uh, okay. I don't know. It shouldn't be using memory that's that high anyway. Hmm. Maybe there's other stuff that's not loadable that it needs to run, and it's not loaded into the buffer. I don't know. This buffer I don't really like. I guess we pass it along. Is digit, yeah, we pass it along, okay. I didn't know if it was because of a, a global string was up there and it was bad or something. It seems like this is bad. So get key, which is in the keyboard. Which just does a halt until it gets a key and is returned. I don't know why that would be bad and weird with memory. Hmm. Could be to deal with this malloc as well. Then again, I call free. And free is on the kernel malloc, not this stuff. So do I need this? If I'm using the kernel malloc, do I even need this stuff to be set to this? I do if the program uses it. Oh, I can reset after the program returns. I guess I could do that after all this stuff, though. I'm trying to think of other issues. Uh, like the virtual memory. See, we're doing malloc here, and then I'm resetting. That's fine, probably. Although this stuff is going to be different. So I probably just want to save the values and renew them, not reset them to these values, because these probably won't be true anymore. <laughs> it's too much stuff to keep track of. Because I, I want to free the virtual memory for this stuff that was allocated, which is going to be this. And then I want to reset, because then this one will be accurate. Probably. I don't know. I'm probably making things worse right now, but anyway. <laughs> Free should handle the kernel malloc. Right. But I need to do save values before I do these. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So these are uint32ts, and this is a malloc block t. Okay. Let's just do, we'll do this here. Save malloc head will be malloc list head. I'll have save malloc vert address. I 
the physical address, and we'll have the pages. Because initially that's set to the kernel values. We're going to reset those when we run the program. Yeah. Oh. All right, we're going to reset those when we, when we run the program. When it returns, we're going to clean up anything the program allocated, and then I want to reset after calling it. Yeah. So this will be the saved values. Okay, which will be for the kernel, effectively. Read the buffer, which refers to these, although this probably doesn't matter, the order, but... Okay, that's not going to change anything here, of course. But I figure that would save cleanup, fix cleanup for later on. Uh, okay, but I know the calculator loads and works, it just doesn't right now for... Or anything that it's mallocking, I guess, which is weird because it should. I know I only care about load, uh, load files, load sections. Um, this loadable section there, it should be one. PT load is one, that's okay. I don't think I care about the other things. We could check the flags. Shouldn't have to. We're only caring about executable, not dynamic. Maybe I have to mess with the thing, though. Or executable or dynamic, not relative, rather. The load is right. I should be loading all the right program headers. We could make more stuff for the symbol table and the section header table and go through and see like which, you know, headers is it loading? Is it loading the stuff for, well, main is the entry point, but maybe other things need to be in there that aren't. I don't know. I probably have some other issue I'm doing. <laughs> I can load the file though. And it does return. It's just whatever the file is doing is not correct. Interesting. Ah, uh, okay. So we have this stuff. So read elf. I don't know what the other ones were. T. T shows tables, program bits. That's the section headers. Program headers is L. A is all. Section groups or E. What does E do? Oh, everything. So I'm only loading these four. Maybe it needs to know the stack and stuff. I don't know. But I'm only loading these. Readable, readable, executable. That'll be where main is. The entry point. Readable and readable, writable. So this should be um, data. And these will be like RO data or BSS or something. And we have other stuff I don't want or need. I guess because we have a, we have a program linkage table. I don't think I need to use that for this. We have data in BSS, text, which is useful, EH frame. Maybe there's some parts that I still need that aren't loadable or something. It's executable. I figure that would be DYN for dynamic. But it's not. Maybe I have to do it on the linker step as well. Could be. Does the linker take in... Pi? I don't think it does. F may not be used without shared. Oh. I may an LD now. Uh, LD help? <laughs> Uh, 
a lot of stuff here. Let's do... Okay, so we have dynamic, dash B dynamic. Maybe I have to do that for linking. Or dash shared for a shared library. I'm not linking against shared libraries. I might have to say it's shareable, it's not a library, but I might have to do that on the linker step to actually make a better PIE, like a dynamic file. So I'm going to try that. I don't remember. I've done this once or twice before, but it's been so long I just I barely or don't remember <laughs> at all, which is not not great, but let's do shared. Okay, and then it's got bad relocations. Okay. Relocation against string copy and read only section text. Creating text relocation a shared object. So those are warnings, but it still made the file. Mm, and that makes dynamic shared object. Interesting. I'm curious. Okay, that did something. Did that have an entry point? It did, because it went there and it has an entry. Okay, that's interesting. So I have like a another wild one somewhere? Well, only for those. I have one in here. No. I mean, other than that overall loop. So it does call it, but it doesn't return. I don't know if this is correct for input character. I can see if it works for batch. So, or for um, calling with an expression. So I do, that should return seven. It doesn't return anything. It like infinitely goes on, right? Let's see, or I could do EIP. Yeah, it's just running like nonsense here or stuff in a loop. Okay. I think I'm closer though. <laughs> this would give you like three hours of me doing bullcrap. This could be a long video, so hopefully people care about me uh, messing up everything. It said you could do B dynamic here. Wonder what that changes. Oh, I didn't get any warnings when I did that. Any different ones. That still says it's executable. Probably not great then. Maybe it needs to be shared. I don't know. Or I need to be able to relocate the text section. I don't know. There's a lot of things I could try. No, nope, that gives me a page fault. So I was onto something with it being shared. Relocation against a string copy. I wish it just made offsets though. Maybe I'll do... Statically linked position independent. I could try that as well. Maybe incompatible with static. There's also PIC. Externals are the same as pick. Locals are optimized. Uh, LD-pi. Ooh. Can I do that? Is it that simple? Oh, there is dash pi. Oh. <laughs> Maybe I do dash pi. That would make sense, wouldn't it? That would make a lot of sense. I didn't know that that was a in a linker flag. I probably did at one point. Mm, 
Hey, there we go. Look at this. Position independent executable file. Well, if you do the right flags for the linker, you can actually do the right flags for the linker. Wow. Who would have thought? Who would have thunk it? Moment of truth. Oh, we still get, well, a similar issue. Interesting. Hey, the cursor printed down there. That's, that's one thing. It's got to count for something. That's got to count for something. Wait, let me see if I can do a not interactive session for the calculator. Okay, so it's just the interactive version. Okay. But you can see behind the scenes we have to load everything and run it and then come by and do like cleanup, right? And 2.5. I just want to make sure if I run it I'm not losing a bunch of memory, so... Let's try 10 divided by 2, 20 plus 3, and 42 times 7. It prints three things. Those, I think, are correct. Okay, and the memory's not down anymore, so that's all right. All right, so the issue... Make sure reboot works. Let me make sure it runs after... Let me make sure it runs after doing this as well. Okay. I know that file will be there. Okay. So the issue is that an interactive quote-unquote session is not working. Because this stuff works, and I return. This does not. At least as far as, I think, this printf. Yeah, because that returns. So let's see, it's when I get the key. I don't know why it's when I get the key, though. To me, that doesn't make sense. But that's where it's at. So it's putting that data in some weird section in the file. Apparently. I don't, I don't really know why. But I can't get a key in a loaded program. That seems like an issue that I need to work around. Or fix, ideally, ideally fix. Maybe because of this, key info address is wrong. Well, it's not a key, halt. I could just have it be a busy loop as well. But... Return output. So the issue is when I'm getting the key. Hmm. I don't know. Okay, well, I'm going to, I mean, I need to debug that, right? But, <laughs> Other than getting a key, I mean, loading an ELF file and running it does work, which is what I wanted to accomplish. So the editor's probably not going to work either, to be honest. But I can load and run an ELF file, which is what I wanted to do. Yeah, editor does not work either. So getting a key does not work, though. But maybe I'll do that on... Well, I'll fix things again on the next the next video of this in another freaking six months or however however long, right? But I can load and run an ELF file. We load the program sections to the right areas of memory between the buffers and load and run to the entry point, which are relatively offset from the start of their respective buffers and stuff. Anyway, that does work. It's just I have issues where stuff's being put into memory. Uh, but that's separate from loading and running the ELF files. It could be because this is global and stuff, and it's going into the wrong area where I load the original file because it's offset from, like, 4 meg instead of 3 in the other areas. I don't know. Maybe I should put this within get key, huh? Should I do like this? That might be a little better. Then it's not global. It's within this function. That probably would be better. Oh... Oh, undeclared. Interrupts pick. Well, I'll have to do it in there as well, won't I? Uh, 2.13. Set current key to null, but we have to get a key. Uh, 
I would rather just do this. <laughs> that would be a lot better. But I'm filling it out is why. Uh, but I feel like that being global is what's messing things up. That might be like in a simple table somewhere that I have to load that isn't a loadable section. I could load the other sections too and see. I doubt that would fix things, but I don't know. I am curious though. Or this can just be like a big four hour long session that takes me five years to edit. That's all right. See, this is offset from like four million. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, actually, 42 million. Yeah, but these are offset from 40 million. So I feel like it's within that file buffer, but it's not, or it's not going to the right place. Uh, but let's see, maybe I want to load all the files. I'll say these ones are the program header things. And what if we load everything? Curious, does it make it work? I mean, other ones might not be valid. You know, maybe. I don't know. We can see what happens. Probably, probably nothing good. It's going to be a lot of uh, stuff that's loaded. But it still doesn't like it. <laughs> it loads to it the same. Okay. Memory needed for file. I feel like that's not right. Well, that might be right. Which is interesting. But that didn't really do anything different. So probably is not the issue. I don't know. It's with git key. So I might have to refactor some things. But that might be outside of this video because I don't know what I'm uh, doing right now. I'll have to get another key. Um, if we assume it's there, if I wanted to put this inside of the function here and we do that, I can just double up on that, right? I can just do that, double up in there, and then this will still work, it'll do the same thing. I don't know what this key is though. Oh, it's up there, UN date, okay. Key info undeclared. I'm returning get key. Uh... Oh, unless I'm looking to see if it had control. Yeah, well, I'll just have to copy that everywhere. That's that's fine. It's better than there being like a, a global. Although technically this does do the global, but whatever. It's, a, it's an address. And in the editor, 355. I feel like this is probably better because it shows me where things need to change anyway. Uh, I need to redo the text editor stuff anyway. So. Alright, I'm looking forward to another page fault right here. Oh, does it actually work? One, ten. Hey, there we go. You know what? I figured out the issue anyway. Hey, 25 divided by 5. Look at that. Escape, return code. So I might not print all of this info. Right, because that's kind of annoying. But right now, I can load and run, and I fixed the error with that. I can load and run elf files, dude. So that's 28508. Let's just make sure there's no memory leaks right now. If I call this thing repeatedly, 20 plus 2 divided by 2. Of course, that's... Oh, because I'm not doing order of operations very well. <laughs> This would be, it's doing that, right? I need to do 20 plus 2 divided by 2. That's 11. 28508. If we just enter a number, it'll just enter that number. Okay, and then editor will load even more. An editor doesn't load, so I, I want to redo the editor anyway and change it. But calculator works, which is what I wanted to check. And I think having this be within each function will probably be more or less error prone for the future. So I'm okay with doing that. 
I'm not getting any output here until here anyway, so let's do... We'll save another two lines there. <laughs> And we'll reset that. We don't even need to reset this because we're getting the same. We're getting a, a key every time. Well, actually, yeah, I am because that's setting that in that address. Never mind. All right, so that's what I'm going to do for this. Um, I may or may not. Well, in the future, I do want to load um, portable executable files, right? And still flat binaries if people want to do that, which is fine. That would be what our old method now, old method of loading would be before loading the elves. I didn't want to go wherever I just did load. Uh, I'm in the editor. Just get, escape everything. <laughs> load elf file. Okay, so I'll have something else to load a PE file in the future, I'm sure, for testing on Windows. But right now we can load elves, so I don't have to mess with flat binaries for that at least. Some stuff with malloc I may have to change and debug further. Because when I load the editor, for example, that doesn't work. But I think that's from the weird global strings and stuff. But I want to redo the editor regardless. Um, anyway, we don't need to get the number of pages needed for a file because we're calling open and malloc. So that handles those things. Um, it's loaded to the entry point. We get that. And I'm resetting after to the saved values we got beforehand, before I loaded everything. We don't have to free the pages because calling... Free on the buffer will free memory. I'm trying to see, yeah. This will free the memory for the executable. When I close the original file buffer, that will free the pages as well. So I don't have to call free down here like I was doing. Okay. So that cleans up main a little bit, although, or the kernel. Although I did add a bunch of lines to the kernel for loading an elf. I could move this stuff outside though. You know, this load file function, I can move into elf.h, for example. So I'll probably do that. So let me do that. Types, definitions, functions. Instead of making an elf.c that I link things into, which probably would be better, but anyway. Oh, I don't need to do... I need to use vim better. So I'll make visual. Let's go to the end. We'll go to percent, go to there, and then I'll... Uh, Delete that, I guess, put it there. So load an elf file. And this will do that kind of stuff. I guess I'll need that. I'll need malloc. Right, I will need that. Because I am calling malloc here. And print F, so I'll need standard I.O. if I want to keep printing that stuff. That should be it, though, I think. Oh, we have mem set and mem copy, that's string. Okay, that's down there. Exe buffer undeclared, did you mean write buffer? Ooh, I did not. Because I have void pointer exe buffer free memory will free it. Hmm. You know what? I'm not gonna do that right now. Let's uh <laughs> this is all free, but uh let's keep that in the kernel for now. Cause I don't want to think about that. I've already I'm already doing uh, too many things right now. Okay. So yeah, in the future I'll have portable executable files. It's similar to loading ELF files, except it already has RVA for each of the program sections. It already comes with the RVA. You don't have to calculate it, really. So it might be even slightly easier. But what, what I can do now is, since I'm not using the, uh, the linker scripts for the editor and the calculator, because they're going to be ELF files, they're not flat binaries anymore, we can remove them. So that's even less files for that as well. So that's nice. The kernel, we could write a form of, or just copy over the elf loader code into a third stage bootloader and make the kernel itself a portable, more portable file through, um, yeah, PIE. So probably do that. That would make things nice. 
do PIE executable files. So I'll look at that in the future, and I want to make this better to not have to do shell-specific for loops and stuff. And yeah, but that's all I wanted to do on this episode. It's been over three hours, so if this is a very long video, I apologize. I'll see how editing works with that. It'll probably be pretty painful and take a long time. But anyway, I do still care about OS dev. I just, you know, get to it when I get to it, you know. <laughs> so I do want to clean up and make the make file better. So what do I want to do on, say, the next one of this, the next video of this? I did get elf loading done. We'll say in the future I want to do PE loading, though. Implement PE loading. And bring back flat binary loading. Uh, if wanted. So I did this. I am using open, close, remove LD files for calculator editor. I did do that. In the future, I want to implement PE loading. Okay. So I'll either mess with the make file on the next one, or I'll make more stuff for the file system for making and deleting directories. Or I'll start on a change to the editor. I'm, I'm probably going to simplify and make it more like an ed, a line-based editor. And I can keep or extract out or make a new like hex monitor, memory monitor editor thing. Uh, but for the text side... I want something simple that I can work with and, and just redo how the current editor is. It's not bad. It's not super large. I just want to make it better. Since I have printf now and I have these new system calls, it would be easier to get started and show people how to make a line-oriented editor that actually works. It'd be a little bit easier to do that instead of this character-oriented editor that I have right now. So, And that'd be fun. I, I've wanted to write my own ed for a while now, so I'll do something like that. Um, so I'll either do that and or mess with the make file some more for incremental building. Probably using GNU make, not POSIX, like I said, because there's easier ways to handle source versus object directories and GNU make. That's not, you know, in POSIX. But we'll do that or I'll mess with the file system. But okay. Maybe it'll be another six months. Maybe not. I don't know. But <laughs> thanks for watching. It's a very long episode. I'll try to edit down and make it bearable. But uh, to a certain extent. Or you can use it to fall asleep, I don't know. But thank you for watching, appreciate it, and I'll see you on the next one. So, cheers. I'm going to refill water, so this is empty, but cheers.